feel right at home. When you experience the service at crosscity.church slash live, you can follow along with the notes and request prayer. If you're watching from one of our other streams, you still have time to switch, and we're looking forward to worshiping with you today. For those out in the lobby or in the commons, now is the time to head into the worship center. We're about to get started, and we'll see you in a few. Hey everyone, I'm Josh and welcome to Cross City. The worship service is about to start, so if you're in the lobby, come on into the worship center. If you're with us online, you're part of a community of people who are worshiping from many different places. No matter where you are, we're honored that you're here. For those online, the best way to experience the service is at crosscity.church live. We can chat, get message notes, find links, and request prayer all from one place. When you get there, make sure you join the conversation. It's as easy as typing good morning in the chat, and our online community is looking forward to welcoming you. Today, we'll continue our series called Perspectives, and we'll explore eight attitudes of joy-filled people. Now, let's pray as we get ready to worship and hear from God's Word. God, thank you that we can gather today, and I pray that you would teach us to see things the way you see them, and that we would be filled with joy. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout.
Over these next few moments, I want you just to continue in the spirit of worship that you're in right now as you think about Jesus dying on the cross and the sacrifice he made, the blood that was shed, the body that was broken. And I want you to think about what it means to observe that, to remember that. Just a few moments, I'm going to ask our deacons to uncover the Lord's Supper elements here. And as they do it, you'll be able to see them and at the conclusion of our prayer time, you'll be able to come and take the cup and take the bread. And after we worship, I'll come back and lead us in the taking of those. But until that moment, I want you to think about what it means to do it in a worthy manner. And what that means specifically is to come to him, taking full advantage of the forgiveness and the cleansing that are at the cross. 
So today, just for a moment, bow. I want to to share 1 John 1, 9 with you. If we confess our sins, John says, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I want you to have a time of prayer where you say, Lord, cleanse me, wash me. I want to make sure that when I observe these elements, take these elements to observe your death, I want to do it in a way that you've told me to do it. Father, hear us as we pray this morning. Hear us as we confess our sin, as we make things right with you and receive forgiveness. Father, all across this room today, people are praying, and I ask you, God, to show them what they need to confess. Speak to their hearts, open up their minds to know where they've fallen, where they've sinned, where they've hurt someone else, whether they've disobeyed you in some way. And then, Lord, convict them and hear their confession. And then, Lord, forgive them, just as you've said. Thank you so much for the shed blood of Jesus on the cross that promises that our sins can be washed as white as snow. Thank you for offering that to us by faith in Jesus Christ. And today, as we pick up those elements, as we worship, Lord, remind us of how personal and how powerful those elements are to us in reminding us of Jesus. I ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. We're going to worship now, and as you worship, when you're ready to come and get the elements, come back and hold them as we worship, and I'll lead you in the taking of them. Yeah. 
Amen, man. What a great morning to be here holding these elements today. If you haven't gotten the elements in your hand, go ahead and go. We serve these in two cups, and if you'll take the top cup by twisting it slightly, and in that bottom cup you'll see the bread. I want you to hold the bread in your hands, if you would, right now. Everything we just sang about has to do with the man who died on the cross. His body was broken for us. Think of the scourging. Think of the crucifixion. Think of them stretching his arms out, dislocating the shoulders, nailing them on either side, and then the feet the same way. Think of the crown of thorns thrust over his head. Think of the cross being lifted up above the ground and dropped into the hole with a jar, a thud. Think of everything he went through. Now think of that upper room at Passover before he went to the cross saying to the disciples, this is my body which is broken for you and take the bread remembering that. Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no zero forgiveness of sin. Old Testament sacrificial system was the way that looked ahead to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus. John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus died, and that blood is what pays for sin today once and for all. There's no more need for blood sacrifice. Jesus paid it all. There's no more need for us to try to find another way. Jesus made the way. And here's what he said in that upper room with those disciples when he offered the cup before the crucifixion. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. I'm stepping in and fulfilling it on your behalf. This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Paul later said, as often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the reason we proclaim death is because when we proclaim death, we also proclaim life for us, don't we? Amen. His death is your life. That's what it is. And aren't you grateful for that today? Amen? Amen. So I've kind of got this habit of asking you to say three different phrases. They are amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Uh, it's not hard to remember, but it is celebratory because we're saying to him, amen. And we're saying praise the Lord. We're saying hallelujah. And I want you to do it right now. Are you ready? One, two, three. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And hallelujah. All right. Would you turn around and greet somebody today? Would you welcome each other into the place of worship today? Hey, Cross City. I'm so excited that you're here. And if you're online, we hope that you've connected in the chat with some of the others who are worshiping with you today. You'll hear us say that we're all about real people, which means that you matter to us. In fact, I would love the chance to meet you in person. We have a guest reception every week after this 11 a.m. service on our Euless campus. Then we have four other services where you can meet our people. You can find out more on our website, and I really hope to meet you soon. Well, good morning, good morning. As you find your way back to your seat, we are so happy that you are here with us this morning. What an incredible morning that it's already been. And we want to say thank you for being here. We are real people finding real hope, experiencing real life. And we are excited that you're here with us. Guests, we are extremely excited that you chose to be with us this morning. If you are here and you are a guest, if you could do us a favor and just text the word guest to 635 Six six, And then right after the service, if you could come and meet Pastor. Pastor would love to meet you right outside those center exit doors, right in our guest reception room. It's right by Cup. It will only take a few moments, but he would love to be able to meet you and to hear more about you. The other thing we want to talk about is our ladies. We want to talk about our spring ladies dinner that is coming up on April 25th. We have a ladies dinner 
Jackie C. King will be the one that will be speaking at the ladies' dinner. She is a well-known author, a teacher, and a, and a speaker. She's going to do a fantastic job. You can find out about it and you'll know more about it at CrossCity.Church, the ladies' dinner. But it's on April 25th. We want to have some food, some fun, and fellowship, and you're going to want to be a part of that. And then when you think about it, you flip the month to May. It's May 2nd. That is the National Day of Prayer. And boy, do we need to be praying right now. Now, don't we? So we want to have the opportunity, want to give you the opportunity as well to join us on May 2nd from noon to 1 in our chapel where we will come together for a time of prayer. We will pray for our nation, we'll pray for our community, we'll pray for our leaders, but it's just an opportunity for all of us to come together for prayer. And again, you can find out more about that prayer time, again, at crossseed.church slash prayer. And then we want to say thank you. Thank you for each one of you who take time to serve each and every Sunday and throughout the week. And we want to have the opportunity as a staff to reach out to you and invest in you the way that you've invested in our church. And on May 5th, we will have our Appreciate event from 5 to 7 in the Commons. It'll be a great time together. Who knows what's going to happen that day? Who knows what staff member is going to be embarrassed that day? But you're going to want to come and find out about that. But again, it's just an opportunity for us to say thank you for how much time that you put in to serving each and every week. Again, find out more about that, crosscity.church slash appreciate. And then can you believe that summer is almost here? Somebody said something about summer a little while ago, and I thought, oh my gosh, summer. But we have some great opportunities for our next-gen ministry to really have an opportunity to find out more about God and how they can know God even more. First of all, we have our Epic Week. We'll we'll kick off on June 3rd, from June 3rd to June 6th. It's It's a cruise, a jungle cruise right here at Cross City. And along that jungle cruise, they will take a stop to find out about who God truly is and find out more about God. God and God's word and how they can make that a part of their life. And then for our students, July 8th through the 12th, they had the M3 time together. It's down at Hidden Lakes, which is down by Lake Travis. Again, a wonderful opportunity for our students to be able to come together, get away from all the hustle and bustle of life to find out, to get closer to God and to see where their life is and see if their life can be transformed. Again, find out more on our, on our website. And then I just want to pause for a moment because last Sunday, at our North Campus that meets up at Caprock Elementary, they had five people get baptized. I said five people get baptized. Yes, let's give it up. That's incredible. And one of those ones that got baptized, baptized is a young man, a little boy by the name of Luke. You see him in the picture here with Pastor Kent. Kent, all, I mean, Luke also attends the Kids Beach Club at Cap Rock Elementary. If you don't know about Kids Beach Club, Kids Beach Club is an organization that takes the gospel into the public elementary schools where they meet once a week, one hour a day, or for one hour that day, to tell the kids about the love of Jesus Christ. Many of these people, these kids that go to these clubs, will never come to church. They'll never truly know how much Jesus loves them except by going to a Kids Beach Club. And this one's at Cap Rock. Luke came to a beach club, heard the message of Jesus Christ, how Jesus died on the cross and how much God loves him. And he accepted Jesus to be his forever friend. And he told Pastor Kent, he goes, I need to be baptized. And Pastor Kent said, yes, you do. And he says, I'm going to be here on Sunday. He not only showed up, but his family showed up. And that is a picture of them being baptized on that Sunday morning there last week at Cap Rock. Why do I share that story? Because it's an incredible story, but I also share it is none of that is possible without you continuing to faithfully give to the church. Because you continue to give financially, we are able to continue to reach out into the community to reach families just like Luke. So thank you for your gifts. If you have a gift today, you can just text that to the Cross City at 45888, or if you have a check and you can want to leave it with an usher, as you leave, but we just wanted to say thank you for giving to Cross City. Now, the other thing I want to be able to pause about, I'm going to ask our pastor and Steve Lamar to come up here on stage. As you guys are aware, uh, last week, Pastor sent out an email about that they had found cancer in his thyroid. Uh, Pastor, this week, will be going for surgery on Thursday. As you talked to Pastor, and Pastor will share with you that 
him and Kim are not afraid at this moment, but we want to come alongside them and to be able to pray for them. And so Steve Lamar, who is our chairman of the deacons, is going to lead us in that prayer. We're going to be able to pray and support our pastor by reaching our hands forward to join in that prayer. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Steve. Thank you, Russell. Yeah, let's pray together. Uh, as I pray, please uh, pray for our pastor and his family. And, and if you would, stretch out your hands uh, to the pastor here and, and let's uh, join in together praying to God. Our Father God, we come to you this morning as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And we claim that and we know that you love us, you care for us, and we pray for healing, complete healing for the pastor. Uh, we pray that uh, and know that you are also the great physician, that you guide the physician's hands. And we ask that you would just, uh, this week, during surgery, that you would prepare uh, the physicians and the assistant staff. We ask you to prepare them mentally, physically, emotionally, and guide their hands with each and every uh, movement and step. Father, we pray for uh, the pastor himself, that you would remove any fear or trepidation, and, and also from his family, Kim, and the children, that uh, they would just have confidence in you, uh, confidence in your strength and your goodness and your plan. Father, we, uh, we thank you for the pastor. We thank you that he is our sh good shepherd. Uh, we thank you that he's my friend. Thank you, thank you for what you're going to do. We claim it. We know that it is all for your glory and your greatness. And in these things we pray in the precious and strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Russell. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you so much, and I, I really appreciate your prayers. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things where um, when you're buoyed up by people's prayers, you really feel it, and that's a real feeling. It's not just uh, I say that, but I really sense that that is happening, and I really appreciate that. I think I've had more than 30 people come up to me and say, Pastor, I had that same kind of surgery, the same kind of cancer, and uh, maybe it was 10 years ago or five years ago or eight years ago. They were so encouraging uh, coming back from that and being able to share with me what, what uh, they'd gone through. Uh, one thing everybody said is you're going to have to eat a lot of ice cream and milkshakes, which I do not mind at all. <laughs> and um, they, they said, you know, you won't be able to talk for a little while. And then my staff in particular is saying, now, John, we want you to really take all the time off you can, at least three weeks or more. I'm not saying they want me to be gone for three weeks so they can preach, but I'm saying they don't mind, right? And they'll do a great job. Richard Taylor is coming to preach next week. He's, he's one of our favorites here. And uh, then uh, Russell Gregory will preach after that, and then it's Jeff Reese. So we're, we're really lined up. Our deacons and our staff will do a great job. And then my wife will see something she's never seen before, me stay in the house for three weeks without leaving. And that's something unusual for me. But um, thank you for your prayers. I really appreciate that. Well, let's take our Bibles this morning. Can we do that? Take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2, one of the great, great passages of the Bible. In our series called Perspectives, we're looking at eight different perspectives of life, eight different ways of thinking that bring joy. Now, the book of Philippians is all about joy. That's really the theme of it. And yet, as Paul talks about joy, he talks about being in prison. He talks about uh, just the, the difficulty of some of the things he's called to and some of the things, quite frankly, that we go through. You can take the top 10 verses that you probably remember as a group and find almost all of them in the book of Philippians. And we went through that a few weeks ago and, and saw that we really do have a lot in common with the book of Philippians. Last week, we looked at this perspective of humility as being a way to live life. Today, building on that servanthood. Please stand with me. And I'm going to read beginning in verse 5, Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. And the subject, the topic that Paul is talking about is servanthood. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And being made in the likeness of a man, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can anybody say amen to that text? Wow, what a text. We say it, we sing it, we talk about it all the time. Looking forward to that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But until then, have this attitude in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, give us the insight we need today from this text by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us live this out. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now, Paul has a big ask today. He's asking a big thing. And this thing is the same, same thing that Jesus asked his disciples, and now 30 years on the other side of the cross. Paul is asking the church at Philippi, again, the first church in Europe, as the gospel moves west, it's incredibly important that this church gets it right. Not a large group of people, about 100 most say, was the largest it ever got. And yet it had incredible influence for all of the rest of Europe, northward into what we now know as the Great Britain and the United Kingdom, and across the ocean to a place that we know as the United States of America, and southward from there. So the gospel is beginning right here in Philippi, moving westward. And Paul says, you have to get this part right. And this is the part that if you get wrong, if you get it wrong, nobody will know what Jesus looked like. Nobody will know exactly how Jesus lived. He begins with humility, and then he says, remember, in your humility, serve others for the cause of Christ. Now, he's echoing the words of Jesus, of course. Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 said, but the greatest among you, he said to his disciples, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Invariably, the disciples were always arguing which one of us is going to sit on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. I mean, even the mother of the disciples got in on that argument. Grant my son's permission to sit on the right and left hand. Jesus said, that's, that's not what, what I'm about. That's not what leadership is all about. You see, the Gentiles, they lorded over those when they call themselves leaders. But the one that's going to be the greatest among you will be the servant of all. So this is, the, this is the way of Jesus. And Paul wants the church of Jesus Christ to get it right. Now, if without, without servanthood, we fail to align with our leader who came to be a servant. Jesus said, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. He calls us to be servants as well. And if we're not careful, we will incur the scorn of a doubting world when they look at our lives and say, you don't look anything like the one you say you follow. You don't look anything like Jesus at all. And yet, when you look around the world, and even a scorning culture, a mocking culture, there's a lot of, there's a lot of accolades towards Jesus in the way he served. Many people talk about his love. Many talk, talk, people talk about how he helped and how he served others, and his words are frequent. People like the words. They like the philosophy of Jesus, but sometimes the followers of Jesus don't line up with that very well. So Paul says to this church and to us today, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And the latter part of that is taking the form of a bondservant. Now, depending on which translation you have of the scriptures today, um, it, it's worded in such a way where it's it can be strong or it can be a little bit less than strong. I like the New American Standard. Have this attitude is a good translation. But sometimes translations will have a tendency to be less, less strong than what the original Greek has. So in the original Greek, it's what we call present active imperative. So the imperative word says everything. This is not a suggestion. This is not something that Paul the Apostle said, you know, you guys, what you ought to do probably is tweak your life. So there's at least a little bit of servanthood shining through every once in a while. I mean, give people hope that maybe Jesus is a little bit in your life. That's not this. What Paul is saying is, think this way about everything. Let this attitude, let this mindset, let this perspective be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that's going to flavor everything we look at today as we walk through this text. So remember the big ask. 
servanthood. I'm going to come back to it over and over, but remember the big ask. We're going to go to a lot of places in these few verses about remember the big ask. It's always connected to the big ask today, servanthood. So as Paul dives into this, he starts with big theology. Big theology. Notice how he says it in the next verse here that we're reading. He says, let this attitude or that mindset be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he says in verse 6, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. So the theology lesson is there, I believe, not only to remind them of who Jesus was fully, but to remind us of what a big deal it was that he came to serve. Right. It's one thing to see God in all his glory. It's another thing to be able to see that he left his home in glory to walk on this planet for a particular purpose of redemption, that is to forgive us of sin and to save us. So big theology precedes everything else he did. So let's, let's dive into this just a little bit. It says he existed in the form of God, and that simply means that he continued to be uh, at all times in the form of God. Jesus has never not been God. Amen. Jesus always will be God. In essence, he has always been God. And that theology is further developed by the phrase equality with God. And we read this all the way through the scriptures. He's in the form of God. He's equal to God. Yes. Now, when we go and uh, begin to celebrate Christmas or when you read the Gospel of John, we hear this line all the time. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. And we know the Word to be Jesus. We'll learn that later. If we haven't learned it already, we'll learn it in just a few minutes. And that he was... Uh, in the beginning with God, John goes on and says in verse 1 and 2. Now, my old, my old mentor, Spiro Studiotis, used to pound into my mind this verse. His, his favorite chapter was John chapter 1. And he would say, John, it says, and the Word was God, but uh, the Greek order is better, and God was the Word. He said, basically, it's clarifying to anybody that doubted any mind, Jesus is God. Amen. And I can say it over and over, but sometimes... The humanizing of Jesus uh, shrouds our minds to the reality that he was fully God at the same time. And Paul is reminding us, before we think about the human aspect of how he served, he wants to remind us he is God. Yes. Now, this places Jesus at the very beginning of all beginnings with God. That's what it means, in the beginning of beginning. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 reminds us that Jesus not only is God, but <clears throat> he is creator God. Yes. It says... In Colossians 1.16, for by him and all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, <clears throat> visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So let me summarize our theology moment here for just a second and say a line that I think it's important for us to grasp. First of all, Jesus is coexistent, co-equal, co-eternal as God. He is coexistent, co-equal, co-eternal as God. That means he always has been. He was not a created being. He always will be. It means he is equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. It is He is co-eternal as well. So all these things talk about what Paul is saying right here, that this is a really, really big deal that we can see Jesus in his humanity without losing sight of who he is eternally. And without losing sight of who he is theologically. And we can grasp the size of his leaving heaven to come and live on the planet earth to save us from sin. Humanize him in the sense of saying, yes, he served, he washed feet, he did everything that someone needed to do to serve another human being. But at the same time, he was God in the flesh. And that serves to remind us that no matter who you are, remember the big ass servanthood you can serve too. Amen. I can't tell you how many times over the years people have said to me, well, I mean, I know I can serve other people. I know I can help other people. I've got other people to do that for me. And I would say, so did God. And yet he came to the planet to serve us. No matter who you are, servanthood is your call as a believer in Jesus Christ. You never rise up too high to serve somebody else. You better not. 
Because if you do, you've left humility behind, and leaving humility behind, you're leaving servanthood behind, and you can't really follow Jesus if you're not humble and you're not a servant. Amen. So no matter who you are, even Jesus was God and served the way he did. Yes. Big theology. Then there's big love, which is closely connected with the big theology, big love. The next line in verse 6 says something that we don't often understand right away, and, and, and I, I love diving into this and, and thinking through this. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, I've highlighted that phrase uh, on the screen because that's something that sometimes people have a question about. But rather, he emptied himself. So those two phrases stand in juxtaposition against each other. He was equal with God. It wasn't that Jesus needed to think about whether he would grasp equality with God or hold on to equality with God. He was equal with God. He is God. But he emptied himself which helps us understand he was not unwilling to let go of his eternal home in order to come and live on this planet. Now, Paul words it in such a way, and I praise how Paul words it, uh, and I hope it's helpful for us. His identity wasn't the foremost thought in, his, in this description, our lostness was. Now, I want you to think about that with me. Jesus knew that he was going to come and die on the earth on a cross taking the sins of mankind upon himself. He did not grasp and hold on to that glorious place that he was in heaven. He was willing to shed the glorious garments in order to come and live on a dirty place like the planet. His identity wasn't foremost in his thought, but rather our lostness was. He was willing to set that aside to come to you. What does that say to you about your value and about the love he has for you? So there's big love here. And I think Paul is making a bit of a risky statement. It risks being misunderstood by some people. But basically all it says is he was willing to do whatever was necessary to redeem you. Now often we say redeem mankind, but I like to say redeem you today. Today you walked down and you, you picked up a, a cup and you individually held it in your hands. And that represents the individuality of your salvation. You're not saved as a family. You're not saved as a, as a church. You don't all come as a group to be saved. You don't get together as a gang to be saved. You come one-on-one -on -one with God, and he saves you one by one. He had you in mind when he died on the cross as a way to say it. He looked at the thief on the cross. He was next to him as he died, and he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. It's individual. So God left his home in glory to meet you, to save you. That's big love. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So all this together says big love. It says unselfish love. It says caring love. Your God is a redeeming God. He's a caring God. He's an unselfish God. He's a God who would do whatever is necessary. Christ left his position, his rank, his privilege to come rescue us. He emptied himself of all the things in order to be visible and reachable and tangible. This is the God who loves you. Amen. This is the God who loves you. And there's no arguing any other way. If you see literally what Jesus did theologically and physically in every other way, this is the God who loves you. And built into that call is the call for our own perspective. You have the same mindset he had. Be willing to be unselfish. Be willing to be caring. Be willing to be redemptive. Be willing to leave dignity behind. Do what love requires. Do what love requires. The reason you know the big love that God has for you is that somebody served him in bringing the gospel to you. Somebody loved you. Somebody helped you. Somebody reached out to you. Somebody told you about the love that Jesus Christ has. So let me make this applicable for you today. No matter what we leave behind, remember the big ask is still serving him. But pastor, if I'm going to follow Jesus and serve him to a radical degree, then I'm going to have to leave some things behind. So did he. I'm going to have to change my perspective about a few things. So did he. I'm going to have to go out of my comfort zone. So did he. So you have this example. Have 
this mind, this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a, a big call. It's a really, really big theology. It's a big life. And now let's define that big call here. Verse 7 and 8. And this is the essence of what we're being called to do. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So when you read that line or two, then you'll see several phrases there that are very important. But I want you to know that, that each of these phrases represent an intentional decision Jesus made in order to serve us. God doesn't do anything accidentally. Nobody forces his hand. Nobody forced Jesus' hand. Nobody forced Jesus to lay down on the cross. He himself said, I lay it down that I may take it up again. Nobody takes my life from me. I'm at any point, Jesus could have called a legion of angels to come and, and remove the Roman soldiers from the picture altogether, but he didn't do that. Everything he did was intentional. It was purposeful. It was with a view of, in mind that we're going to serve mankind and bring them to faith in Jesus and to salvation. So this call for Jesus was intentional, and every verb you find in this, in this passage has to do with an action that is taken uh, that based on a decision he made to take that action. And it's going to be very, very applicable to us today. Notice what it says there. He emptied himself. He set dignity aside to serve. He turned loose of the glory that he could have grasped and held on to. But if he had come down in all his glory, he would have overwhelmed us. He would have frightened us, Right? Read Revelation sometime. Read chapter 4, chapter 5. Jump up to chapter 17 and 18. Read the picture of who Jesus is uh, fully with all of his glory. His eyes are like a flame of fire. We, we couldn't handle Jesus in all his glory on this planet. So he left his glory behind in order to interact with us as a man. He emptied himself. He took off his glorious garments, so to speak, in order to walk among us. Pick up a robe and wear a robe just like you wore a robe. So he emptied himself. When we serve Christ, we're going to have to empty ourselves of some things too. We're going to have to set aside some things too. That's this pattern that he gave us. Secondly, he changed himself. Now, I don't mean changed himself fundamentally, but as you, as you walk with me through this next few moments, uh, understand that he took on another form for us. He was in the form of God, but took up, uh, took up on himself the form of men changed himself. The verb here is took. He reached out and took the assignment. He said yes to the work of redemption. And that involved all these other descriptions in the form of a bondservant, in the likeness of a man, in the appearance of a man. This is the same thing as saying the word became flesh. It's the same thing as saying he that knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He became what he needed to be to serve us well. That's a God who loves you right there. I'm a hands-on kind of guy when it comes to doing stuff outside the office. I like to get my hands dirty, and I like to fix things and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, so I, that means that I, I have to take off whatever I wore to the office that day. In fact, I remember back when we first, uh, uh, I first started pastoring some 40 years ago, and my wife and I uh, were a young couple, a young pastor and wife, and we had, uh, I think at that time, about three kids when I first began pastoring. And uh, at the time, I would go to the office, and I would have... Uh, almost always, 40 years ago, you wore a suit. You wore a matching slacks uh, and then matching coat, sometimes a vest, and always a tie. That was standard attire for a Baptist pastor's office back in the day. I'm so glad I'm not back in the day. <laughs> glad I'm not back in the day. We dressed like bankers. We were supposed to do that. And I would come home and Kim would be there with three toddlers, and she would say, man, get those clothes off. It's time to get down on the floor with these babies and these kids. And I had to take off that comfortable suit, that nice clean white shirt, undo that tie, and, and get in some old jeans and an old T-shirt and get down on the floor with those kids. That's the only way that I was going to be able to connect with them on their level, taking off this nice suit and get down uh, on, the, on the carpet with these kids. And that's what it really means, in essence, that, that, that God took on human form, took off the glorious 
glory that he has and he wore and he came and he humbled himself to the point of being down on the floor with us. Down on the floor with us. Did whatever it took in order to meet with us. And then thirdly, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. For God to become a man is humbling enough, it seems. But he went further. To take on the form of a bondservant is even more humbling. So the bondservant, as we arrive at this use of this phrase, is one who is in permanent relation of servitude to another. So Jesus became a bondservant to the Father on our behalf. And he did whatever was necessary, still does whatever is necessary for us. Do you realize Jesus still serves as a glorious king but a bondservant at the same time? Go read your Bible. He ever lives to intercede for us. Amen. He's still serving there. Yes. So we, we become a bondservant if we're going to become like Jesus Christ. He humbled himself. He became a bondservant. He allowed his will to be consumed in the will of the Father. But to be willing to die on a cross between two thieves, that's even more humbling. And remember the garden scene? where Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane on the way to the cross. And, and he says words like this. He said, Father, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, the cup of suffering that he's about to undergo is what he's referring to. If there's any way this cup can pass from me, so be it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's a bondservant. He says to the Father, it's hard for us to fathom how the Son says to the Father, both God, co-equal, co-eternal, uh, co-powerful, every, every co-word you can think of between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, listening at, at the Father says, not my will, but your will be done. Right. Humbled himself. Amen. Aren't you glad he humbled himself for you? Yes. The example is so strong here that we really have no excuse not to serve in light of what he did for us. Right. We empty ourselves. He emptied himself. We empty ourselves. Amen. He changed himself. We change ourselves. He humbled himself. We humble ourselves. And do whatever it is he asks us to do for him and for others in his name as bond servants. Randy Draper is a member of our church. In fact, he's one of our deacon officers. He wrote a great book called Happy to Do It. It's a book about servanthood. That's just kind of his moniker. It's kind of the line that he uses all the time. He signs his name at the end of a note, happy to do it. And guess what verse he uses? This one right here, Philippians 2, 5. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And Randy's perspective on servanthood is, is a unique, unique perspective. It's not something he has to do. It's something he joyfully does. In fact, Randy has found his joyful life placed by serving other people. And in his book, he says, The secret to living a life of purpose is to realize God put us here to enrich the lives of others. And I think he's nailed it. You are here to enrich someone else's life, whether they want it or not, whether they know it or not, and whether after you've served them, whether they thank you or not, you're here to enrich their lives. And you're empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. That means that you add value to people's lives because Jesus added incredible value to your life. Now, we don't live in a world that really prizes that. We don't live in a world that even talks about that. The world would advise you to do this. And here's a phrase I've, I've lifted from a lot of conversations that I've seen in different places. And it's almost said with a joyful uh, kind of attitude. You do you. You just do you. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't worry about what they think. Don't worry about what they say. Just you do you. And I've never known a joyful person who has that moniker, that theme in life. Because when you do you, at some point, you'll figure out everything you did for you is worthless. Yeah. Everything you put on, you'll get tired of. Everything you brought around you, you load. Everything you pursued and gave everything for will at some point just not be useful, helpful for you anymore. You do you is a terrible way to live. It's an incredibly selfish way to live. It's as anti-Christ as you can be. If you are a professing believer living the you-do-you lifestyle, you need to repent today. Amen. You do. 
Let this mindset be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So instead of you do you, what, what does work? What is our calling? It's servanthood. Think how servanthood, this mindset of servanthood, changes friendships. When you say to somebody that you're in a friendship with of some kind, what can I do to help you today? How can I help you get to where you need to go? A dating relationship where two people are saying, I want to give to this relationship instead of saying, I want to get from this relationship. A marriage what happens when a husband comes home from work and when he takes his coat off or whatever he wore to work, he comes home and he goes, I'm, I'm now here to serve you to his wife or to his children. After the women pick themselves up off the floor, they'll enjoy that quite a bit. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that really helped Kim and I in our marriage happened early on in marriage. And, and, and early on, at one point, I realized there's, there's just a particular thing I can do to help her just regain some of her time. She was, she was certainly busy with three young kids, and there's just a certain thing I can do to help her to regain, reclaim some of her time, and, and I can step up and try to do that. And, and I didn't realize how, how much that was needed and how much it helped. And I would say it's one of the defining moments of our marriage where all of a sudden I thought differently, and she got a little bit of a break. And I learned serving is incredible. That's right. Amen. Serving is incredible. Have you discovered that in your marriage? Have you discovered that in your family where you're serving your children sometimes or you're serving your parents sometimes? Have you discovered that in your organization where it really is blessed to give and not just receive? It really is a blessing to be able to serve someone else and help further whatever they're doing. You know the businesses that I like to frequent? Businesses that give great customer service. Chick-fil-A all day long, baby. Chick-fil-A all day long. I don't want to wander the rest of my life in a Home Depot store looking for one bolt that I could find if somebody would just say, can I help you? Right? Service is important to our lives. Service brings joy. And in this calling as followers of Jesus Christ, serving is just about Everything. It's amazing how impactful it really is. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we serve people who are hard to please or someone that we're serving is impossible to please, not because they want it to be impossible, but because they cannot respond in kind. They can't love you back. They can't help you back. They can't do something to reciprocate for what you've done. So you do it just for the cause of serving Christ, just to follow your incredible leader, Jesus, who gave himself for us. That's why you do it, and that's where you get your joy, not in what you get in reply, but what you get in saying, I'm following the man who died on the cross for me. I'm following him. That's what it is. No matter how difficult it is, remember the big ask, serving him. And then finally, big day. You knew it would begin with big, didn't you? Big day. Big day. Verses 9 through 11, what, what, a, what a series of verses here. We sing it. Sometimes when we worship, we say it. We look forward to it. For this reason, God highly exalted him. The man who humbled himself, Jesus, God highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when I read this, this glorious passage, this one that kind of stirs me up, gets me all excited. I thought, why is this here? It's a passage about servanthood. Why is this here? And I don't think it's here for God to say, well... Uh, hey, everybody, Jesus was a servant. Yes, he was a suffering servant. Yes, he died on the cross. But I haven't forgotten about him. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. It's not about that. I think it's for us. And here's why I think it's for us. I think we get a couple of things in this text that we need to remember. First of all, there's a foretaste of this big day as we gather as the church. Now, think about Paul writing to the church of 100 at Philippi, at, at Philippi and thinking that they're all alone in a very dark world, but when they come together, every one of them bows the knee 
And with every tongue, they confess Jesus Christ as Lord of the glory of God the Father. Every time they pray, every time they worship, there's just a little huddled group of believers that as they are there together, they're saying, we worship the one true God. And one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. But until then, it'll just be us doing that. And every act of service that we do, we'll do so that others can come and their knees be bowed and their tongues confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. I think that's the first part of that. It's a foretaste of something bigger that's going to happen that you have every time you gather in worship. Let me tell you why, as a pastor, I want people to worship every opportunity they can with their church so you can get this foretaste. So you can be reminded that as you gather with believers, we are people who bow the knee, who confess with the tongue, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I think you can see time after time that sometimes some act of service you did helped bring someone else to faith in Christ, and they are now among us who bend the knee and who, who speak with the tongue, Jesus Christ is Lord, right? And the more you serve him, the more people will know and worship the God that ye worship, Jesus Christ. Their knees will bow, their tongues will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Servanthood brings eventually people to acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. There's a foretaste of this. Someone served Christ to bring me to Christ. Someone served Christ to bring you to Christ. And when we get together, every knee bow and every tongue confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. It's a foretaste every time we gather it's a reminder that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Notice how thorough in the heavens, on the earth, beneath the earth, every, every, every. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Now that doesn't say that everybody will be saved. That doesn't say that everybody will come to faith as a Christian. What it does say is, Everyone at some point will acknowledge Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He did exactly what he came to do. And he redeemed everybody that put their faith in him as Lord and Savior. Everybody will acknowledge that one day. I like the fact that the rest of creation already worships him. It's only the knees of people who won't bow. The trees glorify God. The, the solar system glorifies God. The eclipses glorify God. Everything glorifies God. The fish in the sea obey God. Everything glorifies God except people. People don't bow to me. People don't speak with the tongue, Jesus is Lord, until God brings them to the place of willing submission. But one day every knee will bow. Amen. Friends, let me say this. You serve the right God. You serve the one who one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he's Lord. You serve the unselfish God. You serve the loving God. You serve the serving God. So you be the unselfish person, and you be the loving person, and you be the serving person. That's the big ask. And we started with this verse, and we'll end with it. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, taking on the form of a bondservant. Would you bow together with me? In just a few moments, I'm going to close this in prayer, and three invitations always go out. Number one, as you leave, we have decision stations here today. Maybe in your life you haven't bowed the knee and confessed with the tongue, Jesus is Lord, and today this is your opportunity to talk to somebody about that. I invite you to stop by and let us talk to you about giving your life to Jesus. Someone is there to serve you in that way. That's my first invitation. The second invitation is, if you're a guest today, I would love to see you in our guest reception room right outside the center exit door across the hallway. And I'd love to visit with you about our church and tell you more about it. Third invitation is, come back next week. You need to hear perspective number three, and Richard Taylor will be here to share it with you. And I want you to know, God is doing something among us with this book, Philippians. I want you to be a part of it. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father, today, what an amazing few moments we had as we worshiped you, as we took the Lord's Supper, as we were reminded that our knees bow, our tongues confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But until that day, 
Help us to have this attitude in us, which is also in Christ Jesus, taking the form of a bondservant. Lord, when we leave today, help us answer the question, who should we serve today? At home, in a marriage, friendships, work, our neighborhood, wherever it is, show us who we should serve. And help us come alongside them in the power of the Holy Spirit with that mindset, that attitude, which was in our leader, Jesus Christ. Lord, allow us to live like Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.